You are listening to Living with ADHD and CPTSD, available on Apple, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcast. Everybody and welcome to another live broadcast of Living with ADHD and CPTSD. Well, today we're going to do another ADHD episode, and it is called Adapting for Living with ADHD. And so that's basically going to excuse me for that. I forgot to change a button on that. So, okay, so as I was saying, it's we're going to talk about adapting for living with ADHD. And the point of that is, in this world, there are two kinds of people with ADHD. There are those who don't really do anything about it, and all they do is just sit there and play the victim and complain and always ask why don't anybody does why doesn't anybody you know help me or change for me or or do things so that I can fit in and then there are those that realize that they've got a disability and well they have to make changes um, if they don't they're gonna fall behind and they realize that because we all have to live and we have to work and we have to earn a living and like it's not a simple thing like for people who have adhd some of us who are really severe uh with symptoms and many comorbidities have a very difficult time properly functioning without having a lot of problems uh causing effects with our relationships, family, our employment, or just wherever, right? And we either have to learn and adapt to survive or we fall by the wayside. Now, I realize that there are some people who are out there that may not necessarily agree with this theory. But the reality is, is that the vast majority of people in society today are not going to really change. They might make some small adjustments. Um, government uh, laws and company laws are being put in place to adapt, you know, to make um, adjustments and allow for people who have a diagnosed ADHD to be able to function better at their job so that they can be more productive rather than struggle and suffer and end up losing their job because they can't, you know, create a profit or they or they're not being successful at their work. And so there are a number of companies out there who are making adjustments and arrangements so that people like you and me can do our jobs better. But unfortunately, not everybody does that and not all countries in the world are more are really open to helping out those who have ADHD so we have to we have to find ways to fit in and adapt and be more successfully productive and make life easier for us it is different and it's hard to do so depending on who we are like not everybody has it easy and that is just reality Um, we take medications to help us you know do easier and it's not always that simple but we just have to do our best and we have to make whatever sacrifices or adjustments that are necessary in order to you know, get by and we can't sit there 
and you know complain and and be the victim and let the world take control of us and and demand you know like basically be its slave we have to take take a grab take sorry take a hold of what we're dealing with and push forward and improve however we are capable of doing that like for some of it's it's easier and for others it's not and i guess we just have to go and find our way the best way that we know how now I'm going to go over a number of different types of adaptations. Uh, some are obvious, some aren't. So um, many of you probably have a number of ad adaptations that you already use. And then there's going to be a lot of you out there that are pretty new to ADHD and don't really have a lot. So that's fine. I'm more than willing to, you know, go over everything and try to be as ex you know expressive and simple as i can and then hopefully you'll get something out of this okay now the first obvious ones are things that we can do directly that affect us and that's like changing our diet so eating foods that are better and more efficient for our brain there are brain foods out there that we can eat and then there is stuff that they say we should avoid. And, well, some of the obvious ones that we should avoid is sugar. Because sugar is just like, it's like our the exact opposite. So we need protein. Protein for ADHD brain function is beneficial. So foods that are rich in protein are lean beef, pork, poultry, fish, eggs, beans, nuts, soy, and then low-fat dairy products. That's, you know, something that we should try to add in a lot. Protein-rich foods are used by the body to make neurotransmitters, and that those are the chemicals that are released by the brain cells to communicate with each other. And protein can prevent surges in blood sugar, which increase the, hyper the hyperactivity and impulsivity. So, because the body makes brain awakening neurotransmitters when you eat protein, start your day with a breakfast that includes it. Now, and then don't stop, but look for ways to slip in a lean protein during the day as well. So, it's like, you can, if, if you like these things, you can try protein bars, Lara bars, uh, there's raw revolution bars, you can do fruit smoothies. So, yeah. Um... I'm just reading a few things here. There, like, vin like vitamins and minerals are good supplements for an ADHD diet, and um, you can do a lot of zinc and iron and magnesium in your diet to help with the response. Uh, it improves the brain's response to dopamine, which we obviously are craving a lot, and it also correlates with inattention so iron is necessary for making dopamine um fer ferritin levels uh are low in 84 percent of children with adhd so low iron levels correlate with cognitive defects and severe adhd so like zinc and magnesium is used to make neurotransmitters involved in attention and concentration and it also has a calming effect on the brain and then all three of the minerals are found in the lean meats, poultry, seafood, nuts, soy, fortified cereals. Um, the diet is the safest way to increase all three mineral levels. Uh, a multivitamin, multi-mineral with iron will also ensure that, you know, you get the daily value for those minerals. Uh, B vitamins in the diet. Um, you can improve your vitamin B6. Uh, it seems to increase the brain's level of dopamine, uh, which improves al alertness. Uh, you can try uh, Biostrath. Uh, it's a Swiss formula. It's in, in pill and liquid form, and it was used in studies on vitamin B and ADHD. Um, and it's inexpensive, high quality. So they offer. There is offers for that. Um, 
fatty acids can be are really important. Um, omega threes are important in brain and nerve cell function. Um, a daily dose of omega threes uh, in cold water fish, such as sardines, tuna, salmon, reduce the symptoms for ADHD by fifty percent. Um, there's a study where uh, children who were aged 8 to 18 took the fish oil daily, and then within six months, there was noticeable de decrease in symptoms of ADHD in 25% of the children. And the other study shows that the omega-3s tend to break down more readily in the bodies of patients with ADHD. And people with ADHD who have low blood levels of omega-3 will show the biggest improvement in mental focus and, uh, focus and cognitive function. Sometimes the change can be dramatic. Uh, you can also add ginkgo and ginseng. Um, they are herbs that are cognitive activators. They act like stimulants without the side effects of the medication. Uh, typically, adults and children who take the ginkgo and ginseng improve on ADHD rating scales and are less impulsive and less distractible. So that's nice. You know, that's, that's really good. Um, so now I'm going to go over some of the foods that should be avoided with ADHD. A lot of people, especially in certain, certain other countries more than others, we have a tendency to eat a lot of sugar and fatty foods. And it's not a smart thing to do. We shouldn't be doing that. We should, in all honesty, what we really should be doing is trying to eat a more healthier diet like kind of like what I said but the problem is is that it's everywhere for it's out there for everybody right like it's it's a how do I put this it's everybody can get at it um, it's cheap inexpensive um, there's many varieties of it and of course the sugar and the other stuff in there it makes it to really taste good and it causes dopamine um, increases in our body, of course, because we really like it. But there are a lot of side effects and downfalls to eating foods like sugar that are not healthy. So you don't want to, you really want to try to avoid it. I'm not saying that you have to necessarily cut it out 100%. You can, uh, you'll probably notice a huge improvement if that's what you do. Um, but it's not like mandatory, obviously, to cut it out. So here, foods that should be avoided. High sugar foods and snacks. Several studies are suggesting that some kids who have ADHD are turned on by the copious amounts of sugar. A study concluded that more sugar hyperactive children consumed, oh sorry, that the more sugar that hyperactive children consumed, the more destructive and restless they became. A study conducted at Yale indicates that high sugar diets increase attention in some kids. Some common items to avoid include fruit drinks or cocktails, both of which are higher in sugar than 100% fruit juice. Read food labels carefully, looking for the following ingredients, which is code words for sugar, high fructose corn sweetener, dehydrated cane juice, dextrin, dextrose, maltodextrin, sucrose, molasses, and malt syrup. That's all just sugar, and they, they fancy it up with words to... Because a lot of people don't get it and they don't do the research, so they, they don't, and a lot of them, they don't have the time to go and, and go online and look each word up and go, hmm, what is this, you know, and then discover that it's actually sugars. So if you go on your package, um, here, I've got a, I've got a bag of M&Ms, okay, and I, I have to admit, I've got a craving I love the M&Ms. I try to cut down as much as I can. So I'm going to read this to you. Here's Now, this is Canada. I don't know if it's the same in the U.S. It may be. If this is different for you, um, this is a Canadian packaging, okay? So nutritional facts. Now, per 16 pieces, so 16 M&Ms, and this is peanuts. So as you can, uh, I'm not sure if you can see this. There we go. Okay, sorry. All right, so for 16 pieces, which is 40 grams, there's 200 calories. There's 15% uh, of lemongrams of fat. Uh, four of them is saturated and no trans fats. So that's 20% of the daily value. 
And then there's two grams, sorry, 23 carbohydrates, 23 grams of carbohydrates, two grams of fiber, and then 20 grams of sugar, which is 20%. And then there's like four grams of protein, no cholesterol, 20 grams of sodium, which is salt. There's 150 milligrams of potassium, 40 grams of calcium, and then iron is one milligram. <laughs> like they even say at the bottom, 5% or less is a little, 15% or more is a lot. So the ingredients, here are the ingredients in the M&Ms. This is the, the bake, the, the production of it, right? Like the chocolate and the, and the peanuts and the, all the extra crap that's in it. So first ingredient is milk chocolate. So that's sugar, cocoa mass, milk ingredients, cocoa butter, lactose, peanuts, soy, lecithin, salt, flavor. Then there's the peanuts, the sugars, so sugar corn syrup, corn starch, which is more sugar, palm oil, tapioca dextrin, carnauba wax. Like, oh my God, that's like something you put on cars. Uh, gum, acacia, titanium dioxide, brilliant blue, FCS, sunset yellow, allure red, you know, it's just the coloring. A lot of people actually are uh, allergic to food coloring. And then it says may contains uh, tree nuts. So that's a lot of sugar. And now if you eat that entire bag, which is 200, sorry, 400 grams. So there's probably 70, 80, I don't know, like pieces. You eat all that, that's a lot, which is pretty gross. And, um, you know, you don't, you really shouldn't be eating that. Anyways, okay, so. Let's continue. Artificial dyes and preservatives. See, that's what I was basically kind of going over real quickly. All right. Studies published suggest that some children with ADHD are adversely affected by food additives. A recent study indicated that artificial food coloring and flavors, as well as the preservative sodium benzoate, <laughs> makes me think of the Simpsons, make some kids, kids without ADHD hyperactive. So imagine a, a kid with ADHD. So Avoid colorful cereals like Fruit Loops and Lucky Charms. Cheerios are better and lower in sugar. Substitute 100% fruit juice for soft drinks and fruit punches, most of which are artificially colored and flavored. If your child wants a treat, offer him Pepperidge Farm Chessman cookies, which are free of dyes and low in sugar. Now I get it. A lot of people out there, it's going to take a lot to get people to change. Um, people are stubborn. People like what they like. They get used to things. Making a big change is difficult. And as we all know, kids are hard to change. Um, if they've been eating this kind of stuff for a very long time, it's not something that you can just switch out. Um, and they're going to go, oh, yeah, okay, fine. Like adults have an easier time switching foods. They get used to it fast. But kids, well... Kids are kids. They really either like something or they don't. And when you take away something that they really like, like the cereals that they're going to eat in the morning, and you take it away and give them something that doesn't have flavor or is boring, they're really not going to like it. And they don't, they're not going to want to eat it, which sucks because it's hard to change for them. Okay, so foods that cause allergies. So according to the studies, gluten, wheat, corn, and soy cause some children to lose focus and become more hyperactive. So, uh, the study suggested all children be screened for food allergies before being prescribed medication for ADHD. All right, because there might be a problem that could come up and you don't want that, obviously. Okay, so there we go. Um, there, are, there are a lot of, sh like, great foods um that you can eat and then there's a lot of good bad stuff I'm, I'm just looking for some more i can see if i can get some more details um so yeah you want a high protein diet of course more complex carbohydrates uh so these are the good guys like load up on vegetables and some fruits including oranges tangerines pears grapefruits apples and kiwi uh eat this type of food in the evening and it may help you sleep and then, of course, the more omega-3 fatty acids. So you can find this in tuna, salmon, uh, their cold water, white fish. And then you can also find it in walnuts, Brazil nuts, and olive and canola oils are other foods with them in as well. And then you can take the supplements, of course. 
Um, now, foods to avoid, of course, some of this for a lot of us is going to be pretty obvious and then some maybe not so much. So candy, corn syrup, honey, sugar, um, products made from white flour, white rice, and then potatoes without the skins. Uh, yeah, it's one of those crazy things. We really have to be vigilant if we want to improve our symptoms. Now, so, you know, you just, we really have to try and be careful and, and, you know, do things that are better for us in order to reduce those, our symptoms and make our lives easier. Okay, so that's diet. Now, um, things like a good sleep. If we get a regular sleep and we get enough hours and we get a good quality sleep because you can go to bed and try to sleep for eight hours and feel like you slept for eight, but your brain and your body just doesn't recover sufficiently enough because you're not getting into that deep sleep area where when you dream, that is the area that is a deeper sleep. So we need to find ways to you know improve our sleep so it's people who don't have adhd have a hell, hell have a hard time sleeping um and a lot of it is depending on how we are like our um our behaviors are um excuse me I'm, my brain's kind of going uh, dead here for a second. Our habits um, are, you know, things that we do on a, on a regular basis all affect our abilities when it comes to falling asleep and maintaining good sleep. So uh, here's some information that I think you'll uh, like to hear. If you are a person living with ADHD, you probably won't be shocked to hear that sleep problems are a common concern. ADHD-induced sleep issues are often overlooked, and especially in adults. And learning why you have sleep problems and what you can do about it is a big factor in creating a wellness plan for ADHD. So they're going to explore. So sleep disorders are common. Um, studies have shown, have shown that about 40 to 80 percent of adults with ADHD experience disordered sleep. Um, the most common complaint is insomnia, which includes significant difficulties falling asleep, staying asleep, or waking up too early. And then there's also evidence that the circadian rhythm sleep disorder or narcolepsy, restless leg syndrome, and sleep apnea are more common among people with ADHD. So experts don't fully understand that the, the exact connection between the sleep issues and ADHD, but several potential contributing causes do exist. And then many people with ADHD find it hard to self-regulate, stick to schedules, and avoid late night distractions like snacks or screens. Well, it's basically TV, computer screens and cell phones. Uh, these sleep disruptions get further complicated by side effects of meds and biological differences that negatively impact your sleep system. So what exactly do people with ADHD, why, sorry, why do people with, uh, do people with ADHD have sleep problems? Uh, the reason for sleep issues in ADHD is multifaceted. Most experts agree that the key problems with sleep in ADHD are due to some combination of behavioral symptoms, psychological differences, and in some case, side effects of the medication. Does this mean that your sleep is doomed? Not at all, but you may have to work a little harder than the rest of the population to build a healthier sleep-wake cycle. So ADHD behavioral symptoms impacting sleep. So there's restlessness, um, basically people, a lot, a lot of fidgeting, um, racing thoughts, um, you know, bouncing your energy around in the room, uh, like restlessness is a physical arousal, sort of like a mild activation of your fight or flight system and arousal and sleep aren't exactly the best of friends, obviously. So when it comes to sleep, restlessness or why arrives in the form of a busy mind, tossing and turning and laying in bed wide awake, even though you were just falling asleep on the couch 20 minutes ago. Restlessness can lead to sleep disruptions, frequent awakenings, and an annoyed partner as you sausage roll yourself in the blankets during the night. That's kind of humorous. Even if you don't wake up, increased restlessness during the night can lower the quality of your sleep, leaving you tired in the morning. So the fix, in addition to practicing good sleep habits, 
and doing your best to get plenty of physical activity during the day, you can quiet a busy mind and body before bed with some easy to do scientifically proven techniques. Choose from the options below. Um, so you can do progressive muscle relaxation. There's yoga, uh, you can journal before bed, and then you can do breathing exercises. So there's hyper-focus and time blindness. A lot of us have this, like both. So paying attention with ADHD tends to be all or nothing. When engaged in an activity that appeals to your senses in the moment, it's pretty common to slip into hyper-focus and it tends to interfere with sleep. And then when people with ADHD stay up until they've seen hours involved in an activity where they can't pull themselves away. Another common issue with ADHD is the concept of time blindness. Time blindness refers to the fact that your internal clock is not set when you're living with ADHD. Time is experienced as more of an abstract concept and is easy to let it slip away. In fact, it's pretty common for people with ADHD to avoid wearing watches and mostly disregard time as a way to monitor their activities altogether. So as a result of hyperfocus and getting lost in time, you might find yourself with an erratic sleep schedule. Inconsistent sleep patterns can cause major disruptions to your circadian rhythm and contribute to sleep issues like insomnia. The fix is to keep regular. So basically, consistency. If your bedtime, let's say, is 10 p.m., get to bed at 10 p.m. If you're going to wake up at 7, wake up at 7. If you do need to have a nap, make it the same length of a nap and try to get it to be the same time. So 5.30, have a nap at 5.30 and 20 minutes. That's all you got to do. Constant, consistent, and then it'll help. So, physiological symptoms of ADHD that impact sleep. Sleep is a complicated activity regulated by two key symptoms in your body, your sleep drive and your circadian alerting system. Your sleep drive builds up during the day and makes you feel sleepy at night. Your circadian alerting system works on a 24 hour schedule and sends signals that tell your body when it's time to sleep and time to be awake. It has been found that people with ADHD often have irregularities in the signaling system that negatively impact sleep quality and quantity. ADHD and the circadian rhythm dysfunction. It is common for people with ADHD to have delayed circadian rhythms known more commonly as being a night owl. With a delayed circadian rhythm, your sleep signals are delayed by two hours or more beyond what is considered a normal bedtime. As a result, it is harder to fall asleep and you have a tendency to want to sleep in. You might feel more comfortable living life as a semi-nocturnal being, but society isn't really set up for that. There is also evidence that there, that there is less stability in daily rhythms, which can negatively impact how efficiently you sleep. These daily rhythms control signals for alertness and downtime, which could leave you feeling sleepy and alert at the wrong times. So the fix is find your rhythm. Cues like light and darkness are extremely important for maintaining a healthy circadian rhythm. People with ADHD often find they sleep better while camping outside, likely because of their natural exposure to light and darkness. If sleeping outside forever isn't your jam, you can build a healthier rhythm by getting 20 minutes of light exposure in the morning or use artificial light like a happy lamp. Excuse me. Early light exposure can help shift your circadian rhythm backwards so that it's easier to fall asleep at a normal hour. Okay, other stuff. So, melatonin delays in ADHD. Melatonin is a key hormone for sleep. It gets released by your circadian alerting system in the evening before your normal bedtime to help you fall asleep and your body pumps it during the night to keep you snoozing. Research has found that people with ADHD who have trouble falling asleep often have a delay in the melatonin release. The fix is if you have trouble falling asleep and you have ADHD, you can try a melatonin supplement. Just make sure to stick with a low dose as that better mimics your body's natural levels. You should also cycle off melatonin regularly so that it doesn't negatively affect your natural production. All right, ADHD and sleep drive. 
your sleep drive or sleep pressure builds up during the day due to rising levels of chemical called adenosine. It peaks around 16 hours after you wake up, resulting in you feeling sleepy and wanting to crawl into your bed. Although people with ADHD appear to have normal sleep drives, they are more likely to engage in behaviors that disrupt sleep pressure. The most common sleep pressure disruptors among people with ADHD are excessive caffeine use and daytime napping. Caffeine binds to adenosine, which can cause a delay in sleep pressure if you drink too much or have it too late. Napping resets adenosine levels, which also delays sleep pressure since your brain has to start over with the buildup. The fix is to drink caffeine wisely and nap strategically. You can avoid caffeine within around eight hours of bedtime and try to stick to four cups or less during the day, which is about 400 milligrams. Try to keep naps to 20 minutes or less and get them in before two. Excellent. Oh, wow. Okay, so. So how to sleep better when you have ADHD. Boost your sleep environment. In addition to an inviting bed, some decluttering and a cool room, between 60 to 67 Fahrenheit or 16 to 19 Celsius for the rest of us. You can absolutely transform your sleep by adding in a sound machine and sleep mask or blackout curtains. Sounds like pink noise, um, think ocean waves and rain have been shown to boost sleep stability. Uh, sleep mask or blackout curtains keep things dark and it boosts melatonin. Stimulus control. Stimulus control is the clinical word for stop doing stuff in your bed that isn't sleep. When you do activities in your bed, like watching TV, working, or rage texting your ex, your brain begins to associate these activities with the bed. Your body runs on programs like this, and strengthening the body, or sorry, the program of, of, of bed equals sleep and sex means having an easier time falling asleep. Keep regular. Yeah, okay, we get it. This one is hard. Do your best to focus on one consistent thing, such as waking up at the same time every morning. Try scheduling something fun in the morning to give yourself an incentive. Buy a special coffee, do some yoga, walk the dog, get a bullet journal, and have fun with creativity. Whatever works to get you looking forward to mornings. Four, see the light. Getting 20 minutes of natural light in the morning is an ideal way to help regulate your circadian rhythm. If it's not feasible, grab yourself a happy lamp and set it up at your desk for some morning light sessions. And then five is just log off. Put away electronics for an hour or so before your desired bedtime. It can have a massive effect on sleep. Scrolling your phone is emotionally activating and also emits blue light. Blue light suppresses melatonin two times stronger than other types of light. It will also help you prevent traveling down rabbit holes of weird content in the wee hours of morning. You can also help your body produce a bit more melatonin by turning off overhead lights and using a red light bulb before bedtime. Wow, that's some good information there. I hope that stuff's um, informative and helpful for you guys when it comes to sleeping. All right, so we've gone over the diet and sleep. Now, exercise is a big thing because just like anybody else who that don't sorry that do not have ADHD if you don't exercise you're not burning off calories you're not you're not burning off that energy that you have stored up and it's not healthy like not getting any exercise on a daily basis is not a healthy way to be living bottom line even if you're, you know, you're a neurotypical and you don't have ADHD, you can still, you know, it, it's, it's amazingly effective for us because it helps. Like, but thing is, is ADHD and exercise is huge because it really allows us to burn off all this extra energy and it's very helpful a lot for so many of us um, the nicest thing about like I always go out on a daily like I try to sometimes it's harder in the, when it gets darker early like you got to understand where I live right now it gets dark by about seven o'clock and it just keeps 
dropping and getting darker earlier. And then we're going to have our daylight savings time uh, kick in. And before you know it, it'll be dark by 4.30, <laughs> which really does make it hard to be motivated. But I, I kept at it. So it's, it's really a difficult thing. Now, with exercise, if you, if you do it on a regular basis and you get out there and you push yourself and you maintain a consistency on your schedule, it does help when it comes to like acting as a supplement, right? It's a, it's a treatment. It's kind of like a treatment for, for to help managing our ADHD symptoms. And I really enjoy that. So it's it's one of those it's an amazing thing to do it, it is very helpful when you are dealing with ADHD because you want to it's for a lot of us it's one of the easiest ways to deal with ADHD and to help minimize our symptoms and i know that there are people out there who have a difficult time and Getting out and exercising just isn't always necessary, or, or not, not, excuse me, not necessary. It's not a capable, like the easiest thing to start and to do. So, here's something I'm going to read The Physiological Benefits of Exercise for ADHD. While no one knows the exact cause, research indicates it may be related to dysfunction of the neurochemical dopamine. Exercise not only encourages the production of dopamine, neop, no, no, norepinephrine, I hate that word, and serotonin in the brain, but by doing so has the same effect on the brain as a stimulant meth, methylphenidate, or Ritalin, she explains. So the, this is the lady. In essence, exercise does for the brain the same thing that the medications do. The challenge is that the effects of exercise only last for a few hours following it. Since it is not always possible to exercise multiple times a day, other interventions like the meds can be helpful. The increased dopamine produced through exercise can help improve attention and focus in people with ADHD. But that's not it. Exercise also produces endorphins, the feel-good chemical in the brain. Thus, exercise is nature's antidepressant. Exercise can also help children and adults get rid of restless energy, which is a symptom of ADHD. The worst thing a teacher can do to an unruly child is to take away their recess time. Yeah, that was a pet punishment for bad behavior. You can't go outside for recess. The evidence is mostly anecdotal for now. Not much research has been done into yet the exact link between ADHD and exercise, but some studies suggest that regular physical activity may help relieve stress, regulate hyperactivity, and improve concentration in people with ADHD. Outdoor exercise in particular is associated with milder symptoms overall. And workouts such as ballet, taekwondo, which require individuals to really zero in on their bodies may teach better focus. Exercise for ADHD success. Sports can be a challenge for people with ADHD symptoms for several reasons. Novelty is a key factor in grabbing and holding the attention of someone with ADHD. Consider not only participating in a variety of sports to keep boredom away, but change at the time of day and type of music listen to just to keep things interesting. Also, it gives some thought to the type of physical activity. Aerobic exercises like running, elliptical machines, cycling, and so on, increase the neurotransmitter levels, which is important. Calming exercises have their place as well. There are calming exercises that slow the system and have tremendous benefit. Occupational therapists specializing in pediatrics say, this, this lady was saying, there are yoga programs designed to help calm children with ADHD and allow them to focus better. So team sports, such as like baseball, may be difficult for some people, but this can vary by individual. So some people with ADHD symptoms should avoid sports with inherent danger, such as like extreme mountain biking and bungee jumping, as they can get caught up in the rush of the excitement and not realize the possible hazards. And then don't forget the structure and the reward. A, law, a written log of goals can be kept with rewards for every certain number of workouts. Always have rewards to strengthen the motivation. 
like Starbucks coffee after the exercise or a new book after two weeks of sticking to the program. Um, pretty cool, you know, like there's no doubt the exercise is hard work, but the, but both the mental and the physical benefits of exercise, especially for someone with ADHD, are definitely worth it. Now, personal story. Um, when I grew up, being raised in a family where sports was the big, the big thing, number one kind of thing that we did compared to uh, other stuff like music and I don't know. I, I can't think of anything else at the moment, but we were always big on sports. Um, my father and his brothers and some of my sisters participated in team sports, individual sports. Um, most of them are quite athletic and well, so it's kind of, I guess you could say it is natural for us to be involved in sports. Now, the one thing I remember from an early age being a, sp a fan of sports and really enjoying watching it and eventually uh, I got to an age where I was able to participate and take you know act like in school we were I was playing sports uh, I think I'm trying to remember off the top of my head it's been a very long time actually I think it's like 40 years since I when I started my first sport that I really took I literally participated in that I can remember was hockey I know you're saying, oh, typical Canadian hockey, you know, while well, it's true, um, a large majority of kids more so back in the 80s and the 90s was, um, were involved in hockey. And so, um, I, I started, yeah, like I started when I was, well, I started skating when I was four and I got involved in my first um, organized hockey at the age of five, and I played until I was 13. And I guess, like, it was it was fun, and I was really good at it. Well, I wasn't. I'm okay. I let's let's. When I say good, I wasn't on the same scale as uh, Sidney Crosby, Wayne Gretzky, um, Connor McDavid. Uh, for you people over in Europe or other part of the countries, you probably really don't know those names too much. Um, they're professional hockey players in the National Hockey League, or and or were. Uh, anyways, um, I I loved hockey. I played it every year. I think there's only one season that I missed it because I had a, a I grew too fast and my knee couldn't handle the pressure from the skating, so I had to take some time off to let it heal. But anyway, um, I it was easy for me to focus on it because being such a fan of hockey and loving the sport as, as I did back then it was easy for me to understand it easy for me to learn and get better and I I was always among the top players on my team um, but it was never it was never something that I was gonna go anywhere with and I knew that by the time I was I don't know 11 because I never really tried out for the, the double A or triple A teams. It was just more for fun. Although I did get a chance to play double A one year. And that was a fun experience. A lot of driving and tournaments. Um, so anyway, I also played soccer for a year back when I was five uh, or four or five. And then I, st I played baseball for a number of years. Sorry, I got something in my eye there for a second. 
yeah, I, I played baseball for a number of years. And then when I turned 11, I started to play the sport that I love the most, which is football. It's similar, much like American football. Um, we have a we have the same sort of idea. We have a, a Canadian football, uh, f- one less down, one more player, bigger field, uh, different sets of rules that are sets us apart from the uh, American football. But anyway, I. I was really, really good. Like I was, that was my, that was my supreme, supreme number one sport that I always knew. And I was really good at it. And I was very knowledgeable. Uh, It helped that I was around football from the age of six. My uh, father was a coach and with the local team. And I went to all the practices and I even... Well, I participated to some degree. I learned all my stuff from him and from watching practices and partaking and stuff. And by the time I was 11, I, well, I knew a lot. Like I didn't, I hadn't even played yet organized like to, to the same degree as some people had, but it was easy to get into. I didn't really struggle. I knew a lot. Um, I had a, I was, if it wasn't for the fact that I'm, I wasn't the most athletic person, uh, as, as I'm sure you're aware of, especially in the United States, professional football players, the ones that are getting the big money and, you know, get to play for the NFL, most of the best players are like six feet or more. Uh, that's the vast majority of them. Um, really strong, built, uh, and they're very fast. They can run like a lot of the top stars can run uh, 40 yards in 4.4 seconds, 4.5 seconds, which is extremely fast. So imagine watching that. You know, you know how that is. Uh, I think. Uh, I can't remember his name. Uh, I'm not going to try and figure that out. But these 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 players are big, strong, athletic, and I was not really that. Like I was five nine. Uh, I was athletic. Um, I was very flexible, strong. Um, I had the intellect and the mental capabilities of playing the game, but I just wasn't physically the right shape. Even if I had been an extremely amazing talent, like let's say the skills of a Tom Brady or Joe Montana or for the newer guys, uh, Patrick Mahomes of Kansas City. If I had that kind of talent and speed, I probably would have been overlooked because I wasn't very tall. Now in Canadian football, there have been some starting quarterbacks that haven't exactly been super tall. We've had five foot ten, five foot eleven uh, quarterbacks, so they're not exactly the tallest. But still, that's not exactly common. So there's a good chance I wouldn't have made it. But I had the mental ability, I had the knowledge, I had the smarts for football, and I coached minor football for a number of years before taking uh, an indefinite break and focusing more on important things. Um, It's when you're young, there are things that you have to do that are more important than just coaching football. Maybe someday I'll get back into it, um, but it's not my main priority today and tomorrow. But anyway, um, I don't want to stay too long on that. So I was always an athletic person. So I played sports and I exercised. And I did it throughout my entire school. So from grade one all the way up to the 12th grade, I took, 
I played sports. Uh, I participated in gym. I did track. Um, uh, you know, I I, t I took part in non t uh, traditional sports as well, um, golf and tennis. Uh, there's a few others out there. I I was always active. I as I grew up, I was always an active kid and a teenager. And the problem was, when you get into adult life, reality takes over right like unless you're a professional athlete and you're making the big bucks and you're doing it for a living the vast majority of adults when they get out of school and that includes college because some 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 people at, at like 18 19 will play a couple of seasons uh, in, in their sport that they want to partake in in college or university so they get a few extra years but when that all ends, life takes over and our level of acti activeness or like, sorry, the exercise, the amount of exercise that we get on a regular basis drops immensely. Now, some people are the type that will have a daily routine where they'll maybe go for a run, uh, maybe go for a walk, take their bike out for a ride, go to the gym, and do some do some working out you know do some muscle training but for a lot of us life gets in the way right children jobs uh, paying off uh, bills a lot of us get jobs that have long hours and don't exactly give us a lot of time to exercise so that kind of stuff happened to me there isn't exactly a minor hockey league for for young adults like we can play uh adult hockey um that there are some adult leagues that are just for fun uh there's no real well for the majority of people there's no real fun adult football league um there's like adult baseball adult soccer but again most people can't they just don't have the time or the ability or the money to do this on a regular basis. And when they have children to take care of, that's their main priority. They just can't go out and, and play a sport whenever they feel like it. They have to, you know, change their lives and they're the main support system for these kids. Anyways, um, so yeah, I my life changed and instead of playing sports on a regular basis uh i did a lot of work i i didn't exactly exercise a lot as much as i should have and my eating habits which <laughs> when i was young i was so active and my metabolism was so high that my eating habits and my exercise kind of evened each other out so i didn't really it didn't affect me like it was probably affecting my internal system i don't know to what you know what effect that my eating had on me at that time but i wasn't exactly what you would call a healthy eater um nine out of ten well i shouldn't say nine um more often than not when we would eat it wasn't necessarily the healthiest choices um we often had pizza or we would have like microwave kind of dinners we'd have processed foods we were often eating things like um candy and desserts and drinking a lot of cola which by the way is no if if you got adhd you got to avoid cola not what you want and so eventually over time i started to gain weight and my eating habits didn't exactly improve as a matter of fact they got worse and i remember early early 2009 i was 
looking for a job. <laughs> and I took a, f I was trying to, I was going out looking, you know, I was doing job interviews and I wanted to take a picture of me because, and, and the funny thing is it wasn't because of my job. It was because I was trying to go on online dating sites and I was wanting to find a nice place to take a picture of me dressed up in my outfit, uh, you know, like work related pants, suit, tie kind of thing. And I took a photo of myself and I remember looking at it and going and thinking to myself, oh my God, this look at me. I look fat I look ugly I, I I do not like how I look I didn't feel healthy I definitely didn't look like it and especially now like later that's later that summer and into the fall I went I, it was incredible I was at trying to think what I was at I think I was at 200 and 26 or something and I got down all the way to 172 pounds and I took a photo of myself it was it was insane I could not believe the like the difference that I I had in myself like it's it's one of those things where you're going Oh my lord. That's that's terrible. Like how do you how can someone live like that? And the thing is is it's easy. Like keep in mind I was living with an undiagnosed CPTSD at the time. I didn't know. Like I I really didn't know. I had no idea. And it was it was affecting my ability to do a lot of stuff like i wasn't being social i i was being you know i i wasn't getting out i was eat, i was doing a lot of uh eating to like self soothe you know a lot of like, people that's the thing people do that when when they're stressed out and they're struggling with life and they don't know where to turn, they stress eat. And it, it gives, it feels good because it, it tastes good and it gives them dopamine and it's, it, they can't stop it because they're, they get addicted and before you know it, you put on weight. And that doesn't exactly, by any means, help with ADHD. That makes it way worse. So eating unhealthy and not getting exercise is a really bad, bad thing to do. You don't, you really don't want to do that. The, but the problem is, is because of all the, the symptoms and the issues that I was having, it didn't seem to matter. I was getting to the point where... I should have just, if I could have, I would have changed a lot of stuff, but I didn't have the, the motivation. I didn't, you know, I, I was not able to to get out there and really make a change. I, I, you know, in the back of my mind, every so often I would say, yeah, I'm, I'm going to make a change. I'm going to, I'm going to start getting healthy. I'm going to start eating more, or sorry, more. I'm going to start, I'm going to eat less. I'm not going to, I'm not going to eat junk food anymore. I'm going to cut out the, the calories and the, and the pop and the chips and the, and the junk food, right? Like it's, it's one of those things that you swear you'll do. And unfortunately it's not exactly something that we're, that we can do easily. We end up saying yeah i'll do this i'll do this but then we never really do and before you know it you're you're packing on the pounds you can't fit in your clothes anymore and you feel horrible like your 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 life is disgusting you're you're you feel sick you don't feel healthy 
but there's really nothing you can do about it because you just sit there and you you just complain and and you complain about the constant you know like why can't i make a change in my life i don't feel like myself i don't like how i look blah 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 you know like it's that kind of example so and it's just one of those things you know you you either there's a famous word it's you either sit on the you take a shit or you sit on the pot <laughs> and I decided to sit in the pot for a long time rather than really do anything about it. I was, you know, I really didn't do the best at taking care of myself. I should have been more, I should have been ha more active. I should have been better at trying to control, like, basically eat healthy and live a, a more healthier lifestyle but I didn't do that it wasn't it wasn't something that I really wanted to do and it was because of the fact at the time it just there was no motivation I was feeling bad for myself and I wanted to do nothing like it was it was just no way and I I was saying to myself well I'm going to just do the usual and maybe someday I'll take care of it. And here's here's an interesting thing. I eventually did get out there and work hard. Like it was not easy for me. Um the thing, the reason that I had to eventually, like, it, sooner or later, there was going to be a, a sign. I was, there was going to be something that would tell me, hey, look, you need to stop this ridiculous, um, this lifestyle. This pattern you're doing is going to cause nothing but pain and problems, and you're going to feel like crap. You're not, it's, if you want to get healthier, you have to motivate yourself. And the only way you're going to do that is by finally getting, taking control and saying enough is enough. I, I wish I could have done this so much earlier in life rather than, you know, t waiting such a long time. I got lucky. I could have I could have had a situation where something happened to me and it would have been too late. You know what I mean? Like you you can only let it go for so long before you before it's too late and the effects that occur are life altering and you just can't do anything about it. That's what happens is we wait and we wait and we say to ourselves, Oh, I'll, I'll take care of it later. I'll, I'll fix it at another time. I've got lots of time. I'm young. I'm, I'm not, I'm not aging yet. You know, like I'm not old. I don't need to worry about this, blah, blah, blah. And, you say to yourself, yeah, okay, I can do this, but no, you know, you're, it isn't going to be that way. You're, you, you can do this for a short, short, short time, but eventually you're going to, it's good. You're going to pay for it. And the only way you're going to fix it is to finally admit to yourself that you're not getting your it's not going to work this isn't this is no way to fix your life so yeah it's just 
how it is, unfortunately. And I wish I had known this a long time ago. And I would have, I think I would have given anything, I would have given anything to be, to know then. So this is how I looked when I was in New York. I was overweight. I was probably around 230 pounds. Like this is even worse. Like I, I, I gained all my weight back and I looked like this. It was, well, needless to say, I didn't like how I looked, but I was hiding things and I was trying to fool myself into believing that I was happy when of course I wasn't. Now, it's just, it's kind of stupid. And if, if you only realize these things before, it would be so simple, right? But it's never that simple. Okay, this is myself recently, like actually in uh, August. So as you can see, I am much thinner. Uh, my face is thinned out. Um, well, I shaved my head, of course. Um, I wish I had a full body shot. I really don't at the at this point, so it's too bad. Um, but I'm I lost a lot of weight. Like I was actually down to 190, eight, oh, sorry, 189. And I know that's not as much as I was back in 2010, which was 172, but 189, 185 is actually a much healthier uh, weight for me. And I think I even got down as low as 179. Uh, and then life got a bit stressful and I'm, and I'm trying, I'm working on it. It's not easy but I am working on it. So this is me today. Uh, this is August, but still, this is me relatively no different than, than, than today right now. So I have gone over all these things. Um, here's another one. We need to try and all these different ways, right? Like now, those are the things that like you can do for um like physical and mental like eating healthy exercise getting good sleep uh doing things like yoga meditation taking supplements um right like those are those are the things that you can do that are like easier Com now compared to some of the stuff that we that you can we can also do on a daily basis that isn't this. It's this is more complicated. If we're somebody who has a hard time paying attention or we're inattentive like I am, or we have a hard time remembering things, you know, like we get told by our girlfriend or by uh, our boss, especially our boss, to have a schedule, right? Oh, don't forget to get this done by three o'clock uh, by the, or this, this project needs to be in on my desk by the end of the day. And you go, yeah, no problem. <laughs> now, imagine, of course, you're on your way home, you're in your car, and all of a sudden, this emergency panic mode takes off and, and it alerts you and goes, and you're going, oh no, I forgot to finish this project. And you're thinking, and it's and it's on your desk. And it barely got touched. And you're going, oh no. What do I do? What do I do? So there's a good chance that, because, you know, bosses tend to leave early. You have options. <laughs> I, I know it's hard to, to believe it, but you have options. You can go back. You can go and get it. Hopefully the room's not locked if that's how it is, or you just deal with it. But you can't do this day after day because eventually you're going to get to the point where your boss is going to go, hey, look, you're not reliable. I can't depend on you. 
So you either get fired or you get demoted and well, there goes that promotion. So you have to find ways to adapt because if you don't, this is going to be a routine and it's going to be a common repeat of your life in your career for years and years, unless you do something about it. So what do you do? Well, the easiest way is reminding yourself. And there's ways to do that. Sticky notes, calendars. Uh, you can use your phone. You can create reminders, notes. You can stick notes on your vehicle, at your desk. There's all sorts of things. You can build routines. You have to find something that you can do that will positively affect your ability to complete things that you work on. Because if you don't, like I said, it's just gonna make things worse and you'll never improve and eventually it gets, it bites you in the butt at the end. So that's that. And then there's organization, being organized, um, keeping on top of things, uh, having like alarms every so often during the workday to kind of give you that like reminder to go over what's what's happening like what do you have uh, lined up for the day what's your schedule like when is this due when's that due you know you're, you're doing all these things that you're that is required in order to help make your work faster and easier and less stressful and then you look more successful and prepared and organized in front of your coworkers and your boss which is you know a big deal so that's that's some of the many things you can do at work. I'm sure there's a lot more. At home, that's a little more difficult because there's so much more that has to get done. And things change on a day-to-day. -day. It's not always going to be the same. And you have to adjust, but you have to try and make a routine out of it in a way. But an easy way to adapt, one way is to have a location in the house, whether it is in the bedroom, at the door, in the kitchen, uh, you can have a blackboard, you can have a reminding system. If you've got a smart home, you can set that up where it can verbally tell you stuff without having to program it so it does it automatically. But you can put things like your wallet and your keys and your sunglasses and in the wintertime, your cup, uh, sorry, your gloves and your hat all in the same place. And a lot of people like to put it at the door because the keys are there, their glasses are there, uh, their wallet, their card that they use to get into the office. Like it's all there. It's organized, right? Now, when it comes to other areas, let's say you get up and you have a day-to-day -day thing that you have to do. Now for us, a lot of it, like very common is probably taking our ADHD medication. So you have to have a, you kind of have to have a set routine and way of doing things and reminders are a good help. But I, for example, have a daily routine. Every morning, Monday to Friday, I get up at the same time and I do things in a general specific way. I start making coffee. I then start making breakfast. I start feeding the dog and I prepare to take my ADHD medication. These things happen day after day. So they become a habit. It's a routine that's built in my mind. So it's like automatic, right? Now, the only issue with that, and I'm sure that you guys notice, is if something during that time changes, like if, or interferes or gets in the way, and it can be anything, it can really throw you off because you're trying to keep this routine as streamlined as possible and sometimes, like I said, things get in the way and you're stuck because you're going, okay, this changed, now what? And suddenly you're thrown off and you don't know what to do.
right? Because you're you're kind of you're getting stuck in your and your anxiety levels are going up. You're setting, you're starting to feel stressed, and so you, you need to find now before it gets to be too much. You need to find a way to calm down. You need to find grounding tools, coping mechanisms. This is another way of adapting. You have to make sure that you know how to take care of this, these issues. If you get an interruption, let's say you wake up in the morning and you're walking to the to an area in the house that you know, you just, you're going to normally, and you see the cat has thrown up all over the floor. This actually did happen. Now you got to clean it up. This interrupts your morning. That could take 10 minutes. Plus it also distracts you because now instead of it in your, you know, you get up and your and your and your brain is automatically kind of going. All right, I'm making my coffee. Got to get my food ready. Pour the water in. Start it boil. Okay, let's start defrosting the food. You know, you're kind of looking at your ADHD medication. Yeah, I know. I got to take that. This totally takes your brain and your mind away from what you're doing day to day, and it's easy for you to get completely thrown off it. And now you got to find your way back. And it's not easy because we get distracted. It's so easy for us to get distracted, right? So we have to find a way to adapt for that. Now, there are all all sorts of other ways uh, during the day. So let's say you're making dinner and you do this on a daily basis or often. Maybe it's just the way your household is. Or you're taking care of the kids and you're making them lunches or you're making them the dinner after school. You agree after a conversation with your partner that this is what's going to be for dinner. If you have a hard time remembering the items, don't just every day have the same problem because all that's going to do is frustrate you. It's going to frustrate your partner it's going to cause possibly arguments, fights, stress, um, anger. And if you happen to suffer from RSD, that's just not what you want. So how do you adapt? Well, again, you got to remind yourself. There are so many ways. One, you can write it all down on a, on a sticky note or on a piece of paper and put it on the fridge. You can also put it on the counter. If that's not the best way, you can make a nice reminder for your phone or for your smart device or however, you know, like there's, there's different ways for everybody to make reminders, but reminding yourself, writing down what is going to be for dinner at what time if there's anything new, like maybe ingredients that you need to make or add to make it right, then you write that down too. Don't just do nothing. Don't try to trick yourself or fool yourself into thinking, tonight I'm going to get it. I'm not going to forget. Well, you might one time, but chances are most of the time you're going to forget and you're going to get frustrated. You're going to have increased stress because you're going to feel bad. And then there's a good chance your partner might not necessarily say it, but they're going to be frustrated with you because they're in the mind in their mind. They're going, why doesn't he just remember to write this down? Why don't you just create a reminder? Like, you know you don't remember these things, so why do you fight it? So there you go. Make a reminder. Simple. Other things. Let's say you're doing laundry, or you have to do laundry. Let's say it's, you know, Monday morning, you go back to work, you got to do your laundry, or else you're not going to have any clean clothes for work. Well, as we all know, 
Weekends tend to be our days to get things done around the house that we can't do during the week. If you don't remind yourself, it's going to be nine o'clock at night. All of a sudden, you're going to be sitting there and you're going to, and, and it'll just come out of nowhere. Your mind is just going to mysteriously remind you, oh, I didn't do laundry. Uh oh. Now you've, <laughs> unless you've got a, a super fast, speedy washer dryer that does your load in 20 minutes and then another 20 to dry, well, you're going to be up shit creek. Because most laundry, like washers, like for mine, a typical load does 40 minutes. And to get it properly dry, I usually put it on the dryer for 60. So right there, that's close to two hours. And then, of course, you got to organize it, fold it, or hang it up, put it away. So it's not as simple as just in and out. So you got to remind yourself, you got to find ways to adapt. If you don't remember things, adapt your life to help you. Because there's a good chance 75% of the time you're not going to remember things that you think you will. Now, if you are someone who has a habit of starting one task and then starting another one or another one after that without finishing the first ones, and then all of a sudden you've got three unfinished tasks and you're at the end of the day and your partner is going, what the hell is this? Why isn't this done? Why are you doing that when you haven't finished this one? And you're sitting there going, uh, well, I wanted to, you know, you're, you're trying to come up with an excuse or you're trying to explain yourself and you really can't. And you're certainly going to try, but you can't. You have to, you have to come up with a method that does not make you think of these things. You have to find a way to stick to what you're doing from start to finish. A good way of doing it, especially if it's going to take a while, is to have a break. You have a timer, let's say 20 minutes, 30 minutes. 30 minutes, the timer goes off, and automatically that timer goes 10 minutes later or 15 minutes later, it goes back off, and you go back to start it. This thing... The timer, whether it's on your watch, your phone, whether it's in the room, it stays near you or in the watch or phone case. Keep it with you. And it's and it's the way of reminding you to keep going, to start up, start going again. It's kind of like keeping you present or keeping you in check. Because the thing is, is we get hyper-focused. But at the same time, if the task that we're doing isn't necessarily fun or doesn't create any dopamine and it's kind of like oh well i gotta do it at some point so i might as well get it done now there's a good chance that something you know you're you're doing your work and something comes up in your head and i know it does for me i'll be doing things and i'll start thinking about random honest completely unassociated stuff and I have pulled myself away and gone to look. And before I know it, I'm working on it. And I forgot that I was doing this other task. So you you got to find ways to keep yourself focused. And focusing, you can use music, like background noise. You could do a podcast. I do that often. Um, I use motivational music while I'm doing things like cutting the grass or doing yard work or gardening because it helps keep me focused. And I don't get distracted because my mind, it has a much harder time in my brain to, excuse me, get pulled away and think of something else. And then obviously failing to come back and, and go start doing it again. So it's a one thing at a time mentality. 
try to keep yourself at one thing because even normal neurotypical people have a hard time doing more than two things at once when it comes to multitasking. So imagine, of course, people with ADHD are going to have it way worse. It's, it's common for a lot of us. Um, just trying to think of some other ones here off the top of my head. Conversations. ADHD people have a hard time listening and concentrating and staying focused on what's being told to us. It's just a fact of life. Not a whole lot we can do without using some sort of adaptations to help us. We're, we can try and try and try all we want, but without some sort of outside help, there's no way that we're going to be able to maintain the ability to stay focused on what we're listening to, um, concentrate, remember what's being told to us, and have a meaningful, productive conversation with whoever it is. <laughs> you can... I had this method told to me, and it sounded really good, and it was actually sounded like a lot of fun. It was a timing method where you had a conversation and each person was allowed a certain number of minutes to discuss what they wanted to say. So I would get two minutes, the timer would go off, I have to stop, then the other person that I'm talking with gets two minutes and they get to, they get to go and then it just kind of goes back and forth. It's a little more difficult when you've got more than two people, but it can still work. My, like, there are other ways. Like, obviously, it's trying to stay calm, trying to stay grounded, present, um, reducing or eliminating things like caffeine, uh, maybe having a fidget tool or something that you can kind of play with. Because amazingly enough, touching something like a pen, it can help you... Um, focus and that's because your mind doesn't wander because my mind it, it takes nothing for me to get pulled away and wander and start thinking about different things like repeatedly and if you have something that you can focus on while you're listening like and i don't mean like you're going hmm this pin looks fun it's blue it's white it's got interesting stripes it feels fun it feels kind of cold that's not what i mean it's you're just kind of moving it because it, it takes some level of effort and concentration to maintain the movement and the like the process that is involved in doing this the the step right like the movement it's just it's enough to allow you to kind of stay on with the person you're talking with while doing this because if you've got nothing, like if you're just sitting there, and I have had this before where I'm, not only am I trying to listen to the person, but I'm also thinking about the fact that my foot's moving constantly or the there's stuff all over the room that my eyes catch and then I get distracted. So I look away, uh, I look away over and over and she either notices it and says something and or I get it, it's too much and I lose enough focus that I miss a uh, 30% of the conversation and it just happens that that's important that part it's tough to maintain it but with some practice and making it realistic and manageable it can be a good tool and it is very effective. Now, okay. The one thing I haven't talked about yet, and I will real quickly here before I end this show today. The last adaptation, which is the most common one, is the medication. Now, I know that a lot of people, they have this negative idea 
on what medication can do and what it is and how it can be addictive and it can affect your brain. Well, that's the purpose of it. The purpose of the medication, especially if it's a stimulant, is to change and improve the ability of the mind to allow you to have better concentration, better focus, and reduce things like impulsiveness and other symptoms that are pretty bad. If you can find the medication that works, it's going to improve your life. It will make ADHD less of a problem and more something that you can handle properly and efficiently. It's, it can be a work in progress and it's never gonna be like, oh, just take 20 milligrams for the rest of your life and you're set. Doesn't work that way. Um, I'm sure a lot of you are aware of that. As I've said in a number of podcasts in the past, I started in December of 2021 with only 10 milligrams of Vyvanse. And then a month later, I went to 20 and I've moved up and up. And as of today, I am now on 60 milligrams. <laughs> and it's, it's working. It's doing its thing. I'm also on um, an SSRI medication or an antidepressant because of my uh, anxiety. And it does work. But the thing is, is it's not going to be permanent. You're, it's never going to be take it and forget about it. Because eventually your brain, it gets used to it. And the effects of the medication wear off and they're not as effective on your mind. And eventually you have to change. You either have to get an increase in the dosage or you have to go to something different because as my doctor told me, it gets to a point where the medication could cause harm to the body because of the amount that is in the medication. Now, I don't know, that could be three months away, that could be six months away. It depends on how I notice the medication affecting my body uh, at that point. Um, I did get a bit of an increase in my anxiety medication. I went from 10 to 15 milligrams, uh, of course, once a day. I take it first thing in the morning and it definitely helps me. Now, I know that not everybody out there when they take medication has the same kind of effect and F, you know, help that it can, it does for me. But I, if, okay, if you're recently diagnosed and you're looking for some help, don't turn away from the medication. Don't believe all the negative talk and all the misinformation that's out there about it. It can definitely help. Not everybody has the same access to it. Um, where I am, there are options as far as what we can take. Not everybody has that luxury. So it's one of those, it's one of those, it depends on where you live sort of situation, unfortunately. But it's, it can be a hit and a miss for a bit. And then you get lucky after maybe the second, maybe the third try, and you find the right medication and it starts to work and you notice improvement. Myself, uh, I had a second go around with Vyvanse because the first doctor that started me on medication really didn't know what he was doing. And I thought the side effects were just too strong and I had to change, but none of the other medication that I tried was doing anything for me. This second doctor did it the right way. He started me off on a smaller amount. It built up, took three weeks. The side effects went away. And now I've been on it for about 10 months now. And shit, I'm great, you know? I've only gone up from 10 to 60. So I'm I'm happy and I'm glad that I'm on it. I'm trying to imagine today what my life would be like if I hadn't started any medication. So to wrap this up, 
you have a choice. You can sit back, complain, blame other people for your problems, ask and wonder why nobody tries to adapt for you and help you and make life best for you and do nothing about it and get nowhere. Or you can own up to your disability. I'm not saying that it's your fault. I'm not saying that you are at fault or that you're to blame. What I'm saying is it's up to you to get what you need in order to have a more productive, more efficient lifestyle with ADHD. If you get out there, you get a diagnosis, you find a therapist that can help you, teach you things, show you the advantages and tricks and ways of managing ADHD, change your lifestyle, change your diet, improve your sleep, get some exercise, take some supplements, try the medication, you know, maybe find some support groups that can help. Like Twitter is an amazing place to get help. Not everybody on on Twitter is, you know, the best way to, to get help. Some people on Twitter, and I'm not going to name names, there are some people on Twitter who do nothing but complain and play the victim and never take ownership for their own problems. And then there are those that are extremely supportive and helpful and they've done the right things. They've worked their butt off to get to where they are. I'm one of them. I, I'm not saying I'm perfect. I, I could, there are things that I could be doing probably that would be better. Um, I'm making a big effort. I'm reminding myself and getting exercise. Uh, I'm eating healthy. I'm taking medication. I'm trying my best to get a good night's sleep, even though due to other unrelated problems, I'm having a hard time with it. And I'm doing the best that I can. And I'm always looking for better ways to try and I'm always looking for help. I'm looking for advice. I'm always reaching out to the professionals. Uh, there is a lot of really great information out there if you know where to look. And if you just ask, all you got to do is ask questions. You might find the first couple people don't know. That's fine. Just keep going. Don't quit just because a couple people don't know. There are always going to be people out there that have answers. Some are going to be not the best and then there are going to be answers that are going to be amazing and then there are going to be people who are going to tell you things that are going to blow you away and your understanding and appreciation for what you have and what is out there for you is going to increase knowledge is power that's not exactly new so the more you know and the more you try and the harder you work towards it, the better you're going to get. And it will not only help you in the long run and make you happier and feel more successful and productive. People around you will also benefit from it. It's going to take a lot of effort, but you can do it. Don't sit back. Don't go and lay in your bed and say, poor me. Nobody wants to help me. Everybody thinks I'm weird. Nobody's, nobody cares. Well, so what? If they don't care, too bad. Get rid of them. Find people who do. Find ways to get better. Don't sit back and use this as an excuse. Simple as that. <laughs> All right, everybody, that's it. This was a bit longer than what I was hoping for, but there was a lot of information. 
This will be available on a replay and will also be in my podcast as an audio version. If you guys have any questions, then you can definitely email me, livingwithadhd at cbtsd at gmail.com. You can send me a message on Twitter. Handle is at ADHD and CPTSD. If you find that this show and my other podcasts are really informative and very helpful for you, then you can become a member at my Patreon page, Living with ADHD and CPTSD at the patreon.com site. Or you can just donate to my cause at ko-fi.com, Living with ADHD and CPTSD. That's ko-fi.com. My podcast is available on Apple. It's also available on all the others like Spotify, Google, where, which is Amazon, uh, iHeart. It's on pretty much every one. As far as I know, there isn't one that's out there that it's not on. So you can find it. Just look for Living with ADHD and CPTSD under health or personal section. I'm not familiar with every single one. You can definitely find it. All right. Well, have a great day, and I shall talk to you guys again later. Final broadcast for, uh, uh, excuse me, for ADHD Awareness Month will be next week on the 29th of October. I'm hoping to get some more guests on so we can all talk about ADHD. All right, everybody. Thanks. Talk to you later.